Good morning everyone. My name is Marina Ibrahim and I am an intercultural coach, trainer and consultant. And I'm very delighted to be here and I already notice there's a lot of culture here in this room. But before I actually invite you to join me to get a better understanding about cross-culture competency, I'd like to tell you a story. And that goes, Americans, please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid collision. Canadians, recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. Americans, this is the captain of a US Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. Canadians, no, I say again, you divert your course. Americans, this is the aircraft carrier USS Abraham Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States Atlantic Fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers and numerous support vessels. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north. That's one five degrees north. All countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of the ship. Canadians, this is a lighthouse. Your call. <laughs> wow. I already hear some reactions here in the room. This is a fantastic story. It's actually from Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And I found when I first read it, it was an absolute mind opener. And what I actually want to show you is also, what do you normally see? We don't see things as they are we see things as we are. And that is the most important thing when you embark yourself on a cross-cultural journey. You have your own perception, your own reflection about your, what you, how you see the world and that is all influenced by culture. There's no second chance for a first impression. Never assume, because when you assume you make an ass of you and me. Sorry for the French. <laughs> so assumptions and stereotyping influence our attitudes, the way we think, the way we feel, the way we behave, and also the way how we communicate. And that all has an impact when we interact with people, particularly in the global context. So may I introduce myself? I didn't want to be uh, impolite. My name is Marina Ibrahim and my cultural background is I'm Egyptian German. My father is Egyptian, my mother is German. I lived most of the time in Germany but I've still been brought up between both cultures and family because I have been to Egypt back and forth and also moved to the UK about 2000, in 2002 for career reasons and I'm now running my own coaching and training practice. <coughs> And I also have a passion for Egyptian medicine. I like cooking. And I also experience through cooking that people can also experience you know, different cultures quite easily. So what is this session today all about? I'd like to invite you to get a bit of an understanding of cross-cultural competency. It's a huge topic. But on the other hand, I'd like to see that you take away at least sort of like a compass, an idea that there is that topic around when you act, work, live globally. And it's called cross-cultural competency. Some people also refer to intercultural competency. So what do you need to know about culture is one of the key questions we want to address today. Also, why does that actually matter? Why does culture matter? What is actual culture and cross-culture in particular? And I would like to introduce you to some cultural models. Lots of people who migrate, relocate, move to other places, and I presume all of you have done that experience, otherwise you wouldn't be in this room. You would all have experienced some way or shape of culture shock, but also culture clash, and what it actually means. And 
what one of the key findings is also out of the whole complexity of culture and how different people are there are some aspects where you can start to look into comparing cultures which make it a little bit easier for you to navigate through different cultures and hopefully by the end of the session you can get take away a little bit of a compass or toolkit which could give you uh, an, uh, an idea how to better communicate with people and also gain some self-awareness about your own culture okay and there's also still space and room for questions and answers so by the end of the session you have an understanding of your own culture and other cultures some cross-cultural intercultural awareness and also why cross-cultural competency is a crucial global business skill okay we all aware that technology internet social media and export import staff migration relocation international collaborations all impact of bringing the world into even your office or your room you come into um, the university and also already experiencing that you are in an intercultural cross-cultural environment and that impacts on how people behave how they communicate and how effective they're going to be in the workplace or even in private uh, context but it's very very important for you to realize that when you finish your studies and pursue an international career in whatever context you stay here in the UK or even go back to your own home countries or pursue an international career you would always realize how important it is for professionals for businesses for leaders for managers to build quickly and trustful relationships quick and trustful strong relationships to overcome communication barriers to avoid misunderstanding and by the end of the day really to be productive to have um, successful trade to making uh, great deals and build strong economic economies and also economic wealth that's what you're all here for so can I invite you to do a little exercise just talk to your neighbor for two, two minutes what you actually understand about culture just like two minutes exchange what your idea is about culture and here three different versions of culture any ideas some suggestions some findings what is culture diversity. yeah pardon diversity yes fine yeah anything else our behaviors pardon our behaviors. yes absolutely what else language yes absolutely and the way we do things very good yes and customs thought processes absolutely what else religion absolutely yes traditions and what was that values yes great and 
your identity it makes you who you are very good yes so you know by all those suggestions you are all right you know this is all culture you can find so many different uh, definitions for culture and this is all what it is you know and I'll show you a little bit more in a minute culture is the way we are and the way we do things and we are all culturally different to get a better understanding what culture can be in a um, more structured way is I love this iceberg model because it simplifies the complexity of this um, term culture and you're all familiar with um, an iceberg what is visible on the surface the beyond uh, uh, above the water level is all visible and we're talking about perceivable with our senses not only visible with our eye but also what we can hear what we can smell what we can taste so when it comes to culture we're talking about music we're talking about language we're talking about food performing arts literature holiday customs flags games dress codes so immediately when you look into this room you can also identify quite quite immediately how many different cultures there are in the room because you can see how people dress this the, the color of their skin some of them with their behaviors some of them have, have accents so you can notice those differences already and that's all visible or perceivable with your senses but there is this water surface and underneath is the bigger so much bigger part of the iceberg which is invisible and this is the most interesting part of culture part of which is actually embedded in yourself anyway but how much do you actually know about it it's actually even unconscious and you would only be able to start to understand it better once you meet with another culture because then you start to be able to be the, in the position to be able to compare and only through comparison will you be able to become self culturally aware and also more aware of the other culture and as I said you are all were right by saying you know religious beliefs the way how we think the way um, traditions are embedded in our culture the way how we problem uh, approach problem solving um, the way we raise children learning styles etiquette body language traditions nature friendships values is all embedded in culture but too often it's invisible and we also have different values of uh, sorry different levels of culture so not only are we talking about national cultures you know where people initially come from geography um, from countries but we also have um, local cultures we have you know even professional cultures we're talking about um, industry sectors and their cultures or companies actually have their cultures yeah so it's a very multi leveled multi layered level of culture as well which is absolutely crucial for you to know so think about you you know when you move to this um, place here in Stockholm Trent University how was it for you it was although you moved from let's say you know even if you were living in the UK from one place to another from one city to another you're already experiencing different cultural um, um, contexts and, and, and structures and rules and behaviors so just keep that in mind and then what is cross-cultural I mean really cross-culture is a very um, interesting aspect it depends on how you actually experience it you can experience it in a very moment of time by when you're meeting a person from a different culture that is often related to culture clash and the other aspect is 
through relocating, from moving from one country to another and living and working there for a certain period of time that you're completely exposed to a cross-culture experience which is called culture shock. So I'd like to invite you for a minute to just think about a time where you moved from one location to another. Just think about it for a moment and what your experience was. Just let it sink in for a moment and uh, allow yourself to, to, to connect with this experience. And if you want to share, I'd like to hear from you. So that you can describe even, you know, uh, a most confusing or difficult moment or may as well something which, you know, was in enjoyable. Yeah, please. Uh, I'll share my moments. Yes, please. One of them was a long time ago when I was young. Yeah. The first time I went abroad. And um, it, was, it was queued for a bus. And everybody queued for a bus until the bus came. And then everybody just ran it. <laughs> it was totally unexpected for me. So that was a cultural shock. Fantastic, um, yes. And another one was um, from another person's point of view. Um, I had a, a Spanish student uh, stay with me yeah. uh, on a cultural exchange and they'd arrive really late at night, like two in the morning. Um, and the next day we just allowed them to, to stay in bed late and didn't get up early. So they got maybe 11 o'clock, but we put the breakfast things out and not knowing what time they were going to get up and they thought that's what we had for lunch. So they were really confused then. Wow. The British lunch having cereal. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much for sharing. That's been brilliant. Anybody else? Well, I'd like to share one. Uh, I'm from Malaysia. Uh, I'm from Malaysia. So when I came to when I come here, shop actually closed by 4, 5, 6 p.m. Whereby shops in Malaysia, for example, any uh, restaurants and stuff, they open until 4, 5, 6 a.m. Wow. It felt a little bit empty and quiet here during the night. Yes, so absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Great. Thank you very much for sharing. And. Um, that is really good because you know there is so many experiences with culture shock and um, and uh, culture clash, which um, I hope you will have chance to exchange and, and share um, la later on as we go along. So just to recapture: um, cross culture is really something involved with moving to a different cultural environment. Working with colleagues from different cultural backgrounds is also a cross-cultural experience and also experiencing differences to your own culture, which is absolutely crucial. And uh, another aspect which is absolutely important as well is becoming aware of your own culture. You just take things for granted, but when you meet another culture, it will be completely different. So, when, when culture cross, when cultures cross, um, you have the um, experience of culture shock and clash, culture clash. And I'd like to introduce you to um, culture shock. And that is a, an experience which I have been involved with myself, and I'm sure you can also relate to it. It's about um, a roller coaster of emotions, which is involved when you move from one country to another and stay there for a certain, pound, uh, a certain amount of time. We're probably talking about three, four months uh, at minimum because that is when it actually kicks in. Until then, you may as well experience the different stages which I bring forward. Um, these are the stages of how you actually adapt and that adaptation process takes, um, depending on you know, your individual, circ uh, individual circumstances, how you easily adapt or slower adapt. So we're all different in that process. And it also helps um, to reflect on what sort of attitude you bring into the whole um, experience. So when we break them down into the four stages of honeymoon, frustration, adjustment, and mastery, the four stages are starting with, think about you know, you going to a new place, 
uh, you probably can also relate to um, when you came to university here, how it all felt for you. Um, when you first arrived here, uh, meeting a lot of new people and, um, you know, getting involved and, and, and prepared for, for your studies. So what was your attitude towards it? Was it more open? Was it more acceptant, more trustful, uh, trustful, or was it more suspicious, fearful, or uh, even, you know, with some preconceptions embedded? That actually already helps you to um, identify how quick or how slowly you are adapt to a new uh, environment. And then the second stage, frustration, is actually when you really experience there are some differences here. And you start comparing what you know where you're originally from and how the new environment feels for you what do you think of it is it is it you know comfortable or is it more you know uncomfortable <coughs> do you feel frustration confusion tension embarrassment even or do you feel more embedded into it more adaptable <coughs> and the third the critical element here is um, adjustment what sort of coping strategies do you actually develop? And the, one of the key things is here the element of choice. You decide whether you want to continue or you rather want to withdraw yourself. I mean, I had my own personal experience, and this is really interesting to share with you. Um, I went to France when I was, um, was uh, a young girl. Um, I studied French at school and I was really keen on wanting to know more, learn, learn, learn French a bit more uh, in depth. So I decided to go and live in France as an au pair. And uh, that's normally you live in the con uh, within the family. But there was no preparation whatsoever for me to actually go and live and work there. They just found a host family for me and it was a family with three kids and normally you know you interact with the kids and it's uh, the best way of learning a language I got completely frustrated because I thought my language skills were good enough already to start um, adapting but it wasn't the case and then I wasn't aware how different the French do things in many contexts and I completely got frustrated because I got so much uh, criticism of how, how I was doing things and how they, they were doing things. We always clashed. And I got more and more frustrated. And in the end, instead of staying a whole year, I left uh, France after five months. And I was really frustrated. And when I got back, I got another culture shock <laughs> because I saw things differently and I couldn't really adjust and uh, I was really, really frustrated then. And would I have known more about this cultural uh, shock experience, then I would have probably been able to adapt um, better in, in that way. So the second time I experienced a cultural, um, ex uh, uh, cultural shock and adaptation was when I came to the UK, because I went to a course where I did cultural um, cultural adaptation um, and intercultural management and they taught you the whole um, experience about what what you're going to be learning about different cultures they give you a lot of exercises and made you understand that there are different cultures available and how you cope with this and that helped me to be more successful and I re-established my career here in the UK with much more confidence and I'm here to share this with you out of my own experience that you get a better head start knowing about these things. You would certainly do. It's down to your choice in the end of the day how you culturally adapt quickly and also more confidently. And it's part of the learning, the way we learn. It's literally the adaptation process is, is comparable to the phases of learning. You go through uh, the different stages of learning um, when you know, you, you know, um, how you, for example, learn how to ride a bike or how to <coughs> drive a car, you probably know how the learning stages actually um, work here. And then, what are the, ca the challenges when you relocate to a new place? There is two levels here, personal adaptation and professional integration. When you're settling in a new environment, you want to find new friends. 
you also want to uh, make yourself comfortable by finding everything, finding the relevant ro local uh, information and support networks. And also dealing with your personal emotional um, uh, phenomenon of culture shock. And really, you know, making yourself um, feel comfortable in your new environment by finding new friends. And from the professional integration point of view is um, really think about starting a new job or when you have had work experiences, how it all felt for you to start a new job and um, getting yourself around, you know, talking to new colleagues, avoiding misunderstandings, developing knowledge of the people and processes, getting to know all your colleagues and their names and in how far that actually um, related, how much learning there was involved. Sometimes you also experience some overwhelm here. And then making sure that you are able to build relationships with those um, colleagues and still having to perform and being able to achieve your obje objectives. So when it comes to culture clash, culture clash is perhaps more um, describable in a context of you meeting somebody else who you don't know but he, that person is from a different culture and that we all experience because it's just the nature of ourselves that we keep stereotyping, we keep filtering, making assumptions, even avoid to um, make an understanding or approach to that new culture. Maybe you're also, you know, fearful and have some concerns about um, how to address this person because we don't know how to, um, how to do it. And also have an ethnocentrism, which is literally, oh, my own culture is the most important one. Yeah? And that may as well also be just you know, embedded by you feeling insecure because you don't know how to uh, uh, approach a new culture or a culture which is not familiar to you. So culture clash is really, coming back to this iceberg model, is something which is, you know, on one hand, that we use our own set of values to judge the other person's behavior, think back to, the, uh, to what we see, um, how, how we see things, is how we see the world and not how the world actually is. And then also that we uh, stereotype and believe that people of a certain group race or religion all have the same characteristics, which they don't. But it's the most simple way of how we interact with our environment and with our world. And it's probably part of just, you know, being natu natural as an instinct, in fact. It brings us back to how we react to situations which can be dangerous or unfamiliar are they actually, you know, threatening? That typical flight or fight mechanism which, we, which kicks in automatically? Or can we just simply relax? So it's a very intuitive way to start to react to something which is not, uh, not familiar. But on the other hand, I, I would like to invite you to always think twice and not make the first assumption the most relevant, you know, basis on which you want to communicate and interact with this person. So how does culture actually impact business? So think about it. Punctuality. I mean, I've been brought up between two cultures which couldn't be more extreme in time. Germany is a country which has the tendency of being very, very punctual. So when you have a meeting, you start spot on. 11 o'clock and not, no one minute later. When it comes to Egypt, where my other part of my family is from, they take time a bit more flexibly. So when I have meetings with my family and they wouldn't arrive three hours later, I would say, um, where are they actually? Oh, man, they would say, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's, you know, they take their time and uh, when they arrive, you can just say, you know, I'm glad I made it. I was really irritated when I first uh, experienced that. And they, there is a sort of acronym uh, in the Egyptian language. It's called IBM, which has nothing to do with um, the computer firm. It's actually called 
ان شاء الله بكره معلش ان شاء الله من so god will tomorrow but if you know it doesn't matter so it's quite a very flexible and also not even self controlled way why i didn't make it on time and it really is something which um, already shows how cultures can already differ just on one scale which is let's say an example being time so i can translate that through to how people greet each other there's space involved you know think about space how um, close people get when they greet each other do they have body contact do they kiss each other on their cheeks or do they actually have a little space between them and just bow not even without with, with, not even with a handshake just think about it and i know there are some cultures here in a way you know who have you know from there's you know greetings from one scale to another business etiquette how you do business with each other the way how meetings are um, organized dress codes management styles organizational structure project scheduling planning appraisals feedback and then also the relationship between your line manager and uh, within the team the role of gender the role of men and women within the business how processes and information is going to be shared decision making negotiation styles motivation and reward systems and how conflicts are re uh, res uh, resolved forms of agreement and non-verbal <coughs> communication body language how much does that relate to you i have you already got uh, some experience in an international work context just raise your hand i just want to get a feeling for who has already worked internationally that's quite a lot of people right can you relate to these have you got some stories to share with me on any of those scales yes please i was um teaching in teaching chinese in um stoke uh, at the college uh, teaching chinese in stoke yes and yesterday we had um a cultural class for um exchange business cards so uh, we have British people I exchange pieces are so they use one hand it's very casual but in China you have to use two hands to show the respect and power distance then yes you have to read a little bit and give some compliments to impress the people yes very good thank you very much for sharing did you notice that already is a difference how we in in the UK exchange business cards yeah showing respect showing respect and also handing over the business cards with two hands instead of one which is very common here in the UK any other suggestions any other experiences yeah would you like to yeah <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not to worry. I think it's quite uh, good for you to just see the dimensions of culture and um I run interactive workshops where you can normally get a bit deeper. I mean the time is actually quite um restricted today to go into um all aspects of it. But what is very important is that you know that culture can be everywhere in every part of the different uh, the business. And really for you is probably quite important um because of the complexity of culture and the complexity in which we experience it when we interacting with people in you know our private life as well as in a professional life is really getting an understanding that there can be some measurements um or aspects or dimensions as as it's also called by Gerd Hofstetter who is a Dutch um sociologists um who made the effort to um research it by his own experience um to come forward with this concept which I really really enjoy and is really um useful um where you can 
Start comparing cultures on different elements such as time, space, power, individualism and collectivism, being competitive or more co cooperative, how people communicate indirectly or directly, are they more action uh, f focused or more being focused? Is there a more a chaos or more structured approach in a, within a culture? And these are just some of those dimensions. But how that actually translates into aspects um, of where, how we work um, is, is quite nicely described in uh, Hofstetter's cultural dimension um, model. And that is about, for example, how you are going to be go about risk or the time perspective, which I've already described with a little example. And how, for example, um, you know, people are in individualistic or collectivistic cultures. The German culture is, for example, a more individualistic culture where uh, the individual goal and um, how people go about their own self-fulfillment, their own achievements, is more important than, for example, the team. Whereas in other cultures, you have a more group, clan, or organizational approach, and there's a more collaborative um, way of thinking and behaving. Another model which I wanted to share with you is the uh, model of Richard Lewis. He wrote an interesting book called When Cultures Collide, um, a well um, recommendable book to um, see how he actually approached cultures on aspects of how they interact in relation to time. Linear active, multi-active and reactive cultures. And he literally used the map and color coded all the countries and the cultures within to um, systemize and categorize them in those three aspects of being more linear active, multi-active or reactive. And you can see those countries listed there and uh, you want to reflect, pick your color and then we take it to the next um, table which actually shows some of those behavioral traits you will find. That linear active um, cultures tend to um, talk half of the time and they have a very polite and direct approach of communicating. They stick to facts and they are really result oriented so you can see, see of some of those cultures, for example, the German and Western European cultures tend to be more in those um, cultural linear, act linear active. Think about multi-active multi cultures um, being a more uh, emotional driven culture, feelings before facts, relationship is more important than the actual um, facts. And uh, the spoken word is more important, whereas within the active, you have the written word being more important. And then reactive cultures are more um, harmony driven. They're really also very um, people oriented. And also, it's very important for them to have a personal contact face to face. And they listen more than they, than they speak. So just think about it. Take it in as a, as a model that not everybody would you know, react in the same way when you meet them because of those cultural differences. And this is a very interesting aspect um, which I just wanted to share you as an example. Think about, uh, uh, sorry, think about um, feedback. You probably all have had the experience of receiving feedback, more or less in your professional uh, context, may as well in your pri private one, really thinking about the opportunity of wanting to adjust when you made a mistake, when you, um, you know, approach somebody um, quite sort of abruptly or somebody felt upset about your behavior, how you actually give feedback. And this is quite nice because you have the scale from direct negative feedback to indirect negative feedback. And that's the way how we communicate in different cultures. Some cultures are more prone to be direct and negative in their way of doing, making feedback. And those countries are listed there, and Germany is one of which uh, I can relate to very, uh, very easily because I've, I've been brought up there. 
but it's really sometimes I got so frustrated about negative feedback being presented to me as a very direct way, you know, and, and, and sort of, yeah, totally, you know, you, you get a very harsh sort of approach to say, you know, what, what you've just done is not good, and you get that presented in a very harsh and strict way. So you, you know, I, I feel so, I felt so irritated and um, really felt hurt as well. And when you experience that, you wonder, you know, is that the best way to actually improve and help people to learn from their mistakes? There's also connected to that the avoidance of mistakes when you automatically have that sort of feedback. You can imagine when you're confronted with, you know, this has been totally inappropriate and you're completely in, uh, imp uh, unprofessional. So having these harsh words in your ears, you think, you know, you'd rather, you know, close in and probably not moving forward with what you want to learn and, and improve. So how much does that actually relate to you building your own confidence? Think about it. This is quite a complex um, um, topic here. And on the other hand, when you have a more indirect negative feedback, I see, I moved to the UK, yes, and I just feel, um, from my own experience, it feels better as if I was able to make mistakes and wasn't really directly confronted with it in a way that I can't try again. And yet, the communication's been so indirect you sometimes don't even know that you're receiving criticism. You don't even notice that you're actually receiving feedback to say, hey, you could actually do better. And that is, again, a very, very interesting way to see, wow, there are cultures there who express what they want to say in a more subtle way, more diplomatically once on one hand, but not necessarily more explicit so you sometimes need to read between the lines. Was that actually uh, feedback? Was that actually critical feedback for me to have some, to, something to change or to improve? So for me, coming from a very direct, um, uh, uh, commu direct communication culture like German, where people would tend to be more explicit about sa saying things, that was also something I always had to ask friends for, you know, did I actually understand that properly? Really asking for, you know, how do I need to take it? Who can relate to this? Hmm, okay. Think about it. It's, it's something which is um, one of the dimensions which I really um, see as quite uh, important to even start about communication styles, how direct and indirect cultures can be. And it is a complex field because um, some of them are, with their messages, quite clear and they say what they mean. And other cultures, you have to read between the lines. There's a Japanese saying which I really, really like. It's called, you need to be able to read the air. the air which is between the meaning of the words, the atmosphere, everything which is in between, because it's not explicitly said. Okay, so I put here 10 strategies together for you to take away as the strategies for effective cross-cultural communication. And it really sums up a toolkit for you to at least get some awareness for your own culture and when you interact with other cultures that is absolutely important for you to ask questions when you feel insecure and not knowing how to address that person or the situation how to adapt to your new environment also make sure that you distinguish between perspectives there is no one way of seeing the world Build self-awareness, because one of the key things is when you actually are able to meet other cultures on a more deeper way, you become more culturally aware about yourself. You learn more about yourself. I think self-awareness is one of the key leadership skills nowadays. If you know your strengths 
and know where you have development areas. You can reach out for support, but you can also build on your strengths. Recognize and appreciate the complexity of cu culture and avoid stereotyping. Think twice, always. And respect differences. Listen actively. Think about hearing the air. And uh, watch when you meet other people because body language can also give you so much um, on, on, on messages and indications and feedback. Try to be honest and flexible. And really take it as a toolkit away and reflect and practice. You may as well be able to practice any time since today because you're going to meet those cultural uh, experiences on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm sure you will. So um, before I actually conclude, I wanted to just uh, mention because I also um, I'm familiar that one of the key mottos of Staffordshire University is about saying that entrepreneurial skills make it a very employable student. So every student who has entrepreneurial skills make you very employable. I take it another step further by saying a cross-culturally competent student is actually globally employable. Okay? So. Before we conclude, I'd like to ask you these key questions, hopefully to take away some learning from today. What was the most valuable insight you gained today? And what would you have to change for you to become more cross-culturally and interculturally confident? Has anybody already got some findings? Yeah? Yes. Thank you very much for sharing. Anybody else? Adaptation process. Yes. Um, um, yeah. Great. Thank you very much for sharing. Great. I mean, feel free to ask questions anyway. Um, I'm here for you. Yes, please. Oh, um, can you speak up a bit? Out of all the creative cultures you've experienced in your life, which one of those is closest to you as a person? Wow. And how does that affect your family? Wow, this is a fantastic question. And this really is my personal journey because I, being brought up between um, the Egyptian and the German culture, I didn't feel home in any of those cultures. This is really interesting. I tried to live in Egypt, and I also lived in Germany for quite a long time. But I must say, moving to the UK, to a third country, actually made it for me because I feel more home here. And that has something to do with the way the culture fits with my personality. And uh, yes, I'm quite away from my family, uh, I have to travel every time to going to see them. Uh, and also, whenever I travel to Germany or Egypt, there is always that little culture shock in a mini, miniature, miniature ver version, I must say. So, you know, it, it reflects when you do some talking. You tend to be, uh, you know, my family in Germany would say, oh, you're talking very English here, you know, so you have a lot of English phrases or words which you can't immediately find an, a German word even. Um, and vice versa, you know, people here in England, my friends would also say, oh, have, you have been in Germany again recently, because I can hear that, <laughs> the way how you, how you talk. Yeah, there is definitely some, um, some uh, yeah, impact there. And I can also say, I become quite um, intuitive about knowing um, connecting to people who already been through this experience, the culture shock, the cultural adaptation process, I, I can sense that automatically. There's sort of like a, 
uh, direct connection because they all have had that experience and they can automatically relate to that. So that's something which I wanted to share. Any other questions? Uh, that's part of me wanting to work in my favorite environment, which is really um, in yeah, sharing my experience, but also giving people the opportunity to perform at their best. Uh, I'm a coach and I'm also a trainer and I help people who go through those cultural changes to not stick to, you know, being stressed about it or feeling low about it, but really, you know, lifting them up to be culturally um, you know, even in a, in a different culture, be culturally aware, self-aware, but also being able to use that as a strength and not something to put them down in their careers. So I help them to become best performance, uh, help them to, to, uh, to do their best performance even in a different culture. So you didn't say what exactly you're training or coaching on? Um, no, it's it's actually um, no, yeah, performance. <laughs> it's actually performance in a business context. Yeah. So I do um, personal coaching for people who want to improve their own um, way of how they want to lead their lives. Uh, I do that in the context of running their businesses, and I also help businesses who want to work in in an international co context to strengthen their teams, build the the, the staff confidence to um, and to also improve their communication within the teams and also across other cultures when it comes to international businesses. So if they want to communicate with their clients, they often don't know about those culture clash issues. I create um, awareness for them so that they improve their communication skills when it comes to international trading and customer service and sales. Okay. How do you market your business? Is it through people you know, or it? it's uh, a bit of both? Um, I, marketing is always complex, as you know. You use a marketing mix. Um, I have a website. I do networking. Um, I also do presentations like these, um, and I approach organizations, um, universities. Um, to do lectures and seminars for them to um, get to know my services. Yeah, social media as well, Facebook and uh, Twitter. Yeah. Um, are there any challenges you may face from a cultural aspect in terms of the environment you've specialised in or you've operated within? Can you be more specific? So basically, in terms of your role. Like, is there any sort of challenges that you may have faced from cultural aspects? So, in terms of the way culture is within that environment, or I mean, that's a very good question. Again, because um, yes, I feel confident with some cultures, and yet, you know, if I haven't met and worked with other cultures, that can still be an issue because you know you still have to learn about those cultures because you know. <laughs> the world is so big and we have so many different countries and cultures, you can't possibly know all of them. So depending on which situation you are, you either have to learn as much as possible of those about these cultures um, or get somebody in who can be your guide, depending on what the situation is. There's, in the meantime, um, I use um, a personality profiling uh, 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 for, for people who want to uh, improve their, their own um, better, like, you know, in a professional context, to uh, raise self-awareness, their communication skills, and so, uh, so on and so forth. And interestingly enough, there's also culture comparison toolkits now, uh, nowadays available, which are absolutely powerful, because it also identifies you, where you, with your own culture, stand in the context of the culture you're going to be moving to, for example, or you're going to be more interacting with. Imagine yourself being a team leader and having a multicultural team, let's say representatives from three different cultures. It would be best for you as a team leader, not only knowing about your own culture, but also about your uh, team, team and their culture, to see how far you're away in the way how to communicate with them. You know, 
in different aspects of time, understanding of time, the way how communication is, um, the way how you know hier hierarchy is understood, and so on and so forth, and then really flex into that behaviour. This is one of the key things. We're talking about flexing, but we can also talk about code switching. So these are technical terms in that language which actually help you to become culturally flexible, to be able to be, you know, culturally, cross-culturally competent. Okay. Final question. Anybody? 